see you. Hey, Peter. Uh, hey. How, how, how you feeling? I feel great. I feel like I'm soaring like an eagle. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I feel like I just look so good, you know? I mean, I always look good, but I look exceptional. Okay. Um, Peter, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah? Are you all right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Why did you want to start training with me? Well, Dina, I mean, I look good. I mean, you agree. Tell from the moment you okay. stared at me. Um, but I feel like I could look even better. And that's important. Mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to get on your plane. Okay. Um, are there any other reasons? Well, yeah. I mean, before I'd walk out and people would like stare at me for, you know, five, six seconds. But now, People are staring at me for like nine or ten seconds. Okay. Makes me feel really good about myself. Mm hmm as it should. Um, okay. I think, Peter, I have to say, I think your motivations may be off. How so? Well, if your heart's not in it for the right reasons, then you're really not gonna last very long. Huh. So, what do you suggest that I do? Well, I think that you gotta check your intentions. Are there any other reasons that aren't about how you look and what people think of you? No. Mm -hmm. What about how you feel, Peter? I feel better. Okay. See? That, the detox that you put me on, I yeah. feel like is, is working. Yeah. Cleansed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sleeping better. I feel healthier. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So I think along the way, you just got to keep checking your motivations and make sure you're doing this for the right reasons. <sighs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's pretty deep. Good morning, everyone. and Welcome here to The Well at STSA. Glad that you're joining us today. As Susan mentioned earlier, we are in part five of a series called Spiritual Sweat. And before I get into today's topic, I want to play a little bit of a game. I have a bottle of water right here, sealed, and then I have a cup of water right here. Raise your hand if I were to offer you each of them to take a drink from. Who would prefer the bottle and who would prefer the cup? Raise your hand if you'd prefer the bottle. Raise your hand if you prefer the cup. Prefer the cup. Okay, a couple of people prefer the cup. Well, the majority prefer the water. Okay, so we'll get rid of the cup for right now. So the majority of people said that they would rather drink from this bottle. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> the majority of people said they'd rather drink from this bottle, correct? Did anyone <coughs> change their opinion? This bottle, wait, I got something I want to put inside here. Some lint I wanted to get rid of for some time right there. How many people would still rather drink from this bottle of water right here? Who would rather the cup right now? Most people want the cup. Why? I know this is an obvious example, and the, it's, I didn't, didn't put any lint, don't worry. Okay? I know this is an obvious example, but humor me. Why would you prefer the bottle at the beginning much more than you prefer the bottle right now? Why? <laughs> it was sealed, okay? And when it was sealed, you felt that what was inside was pure. And you, just like me, have no desire for impure water. If you're going to drink a cup of water, you want it as pure as possible. And whatever choice that you have in front of you, the more pure that it is, or at least what you think it is, that's going to be the one which you go to. Because for us, as human beings, as Americans especially, purity matters a lot. We want our water pure. If we're going to put creamer in our coffee, that needs to be pure. We don't want the old stanky stuff that's been sitting out forever. If we're going to breathe air, we get annoyed when the person around us is smoking and putting smoke in the air. We move over here. We need our air pure. We need our food pure. God help the waiter who brings us the soup with the hair in it. Okay? May God have mercy on his soul when he sees what's going to happen to him because we place a very high value on purity. Agree? Except in one area. And that one area happens to be the most important area. And that's our topic for today. Is we're going to talk about sexual purity. And we're going to see today, shamefully, to much of, us, much of us to our shame and our discredit, that we are much more careful about the water that we put in our stomach than we are about the filth that we put in our eyes. 
And we allow things that we would never allow ourselves to breathe certain things, but we allow much worse to get inside our heart when we are not careful in this area of sexual purity. Now, I'm just going to fast forward through the beginning of this talk because you already know how this goes. Anytime you hear a talk about sexual purity, you're going to hear statistics about how the world is so sinful and there's all kinds of impurity out there and, 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 and the internet. Okay, you'll hear statistics that tell you, I think it's 12% of all websites, 12%, more than one out of every 10 websites are dedicated to pornography. 25% of searches on the internet are related to pornography. 25% of all the searches, one out of every four, you'll hear that stuff. I'm going to skip that stuff. You'll hear... That on television today, on television today, primetime TV, 92% of when any kind, there's any kind of sex on primetime television, either referred to or depicted, 92% is depicted outside of marriage. 92% of any sex in, 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 on primetime television takes place outside of marriage. I won't, I'm going to skip all that, though, because you already know that. And you know out there that the world is bad and the world's impure. I'm not here to say that the world is bad. But what I'm here to do is not look outside, but to look within. Because it's too easy for us to just say, well, the world is bad. The world is bad. The world is bad. We're going to look within, and we're not going to worry ourselves about the world. That's the world that we can't do much about. We're going to look within, and we're going to see where are we on the inside. My goal is not to convince you that the world has a lot of impurity out there. My goal is to convince you of the deadly nature of the impurity that exists out there and the threat that it poses to you and your life. And then hopefully we can come up with a plan together of how to attack it. I'm going to try to convince you that a dirty joke is more har harmful to you than dirty water. I'm going to try to convince you that impure thoughts are more harm harmful for you than impure air. We're going to see that together. Let's start here with a verse from Ephesians 5, chapter 3, which kind of sets the standard for us. This is God's measure of sexual purity. This is what God says, this is what I'm looking for inside my children. But among you... There must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. God starts it off by saying, not even a hint. And for those who were back here in the church back in 2013 or 12 when church first started, we did an entire series on this verse. It was called Not Even a Hint. And we talked about God's standard for our purity. And we saw there is a big difference between how we measure purity and how God does. Because God says the measure is not even a hint. And unfortunately, we have strayed quite distant from that. You see, what I want you to see from this verse is God views impurity, sexual impurity, not so much like a hair in your soup, but he views it more like poison in your soup. If you eat the soup with the hair, that's disgusting. You'll never want to eat it again, but you'll probably live. But if there's poison instead, that's much more dangerous. God views sexual impurity less like <coughs> a cough and germs and you drink after it and more like cancer that goes inside your body. If you get a few germs, you may get a cold, you may get disgusted, whatever it may be. But if you allow sexual impurity into you, that's much more deadly. I have another image that I like to draw because maybe poison, that's a tough image for us. We don't know what poison is, never had it. I'll give you another image that may be a little bit easier to understand, maybe stick with you longer. You know what impurity is for your soul? It's cat diarrhea. You heard me. Cat diarrhea. Impurity in your soul is not a hair in your soup. It's here's a bowl of soup that just came out the microwave. I'm about to bring it to your table. And then on the way, I set it down on the table as I went to go get a cup of water. And my sick cat, who's got diarrhea all over the house, says, you know what? I can't make it to the litter box. Sees your plate. Squats down and goes diarrhea into that plate, and then I bring it out to you to eat. And you would say, that's disgusting. That's the most horrific thing I've ever, I never want that. That's how we're supposed to look at sexual impurity, because that's how God sees it. As something vile, as something putrid, as something disgusting, that God's people want nothing to do with it. I'd rather eat the cat poop than have sexual impurity inside me. That's how God wants us to see it. And he goes on, next verse. He kind of gives us, what does that sexual impurity look like, okay? He says, nor should there be any obscenity. For those who are thinking that he's just talking about like sex before marriage and cheating on your wife, that's what we think sexual immorality is. No, look, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking. That applies in face-to-face -face and also online. 
There should not be obscenity. There should not be foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, are out of place for God's children who praise God and pray to God and sing to God and worship God and receive God in their mouth through communion is out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Just strong words. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient, therefore do not be partners with them. Look, we started talking from the beginning of this series. The goal of this series, spiritual sweat to get into shape. We've been watching Peter every week get his body into shape, and we're trying to do the same thing with our spirits, get them into shape. And we agree in the very start is that when you try to get your body into shape, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. It's not going to make you feel good. You're not going to come home from the gym and say like, ooh, that was relaxing. That's not, you come home and you're tired and your neck hurts and your back hurts and you're sweating and you're laboring, but in the end, it's worth it because you're getting in shape. Spiritually, the same is true. This series has been difficult and this series, I can say, some people say is my favorite. I'll tell you, it's my least favorite because it's making me ask myself hard questions and dig deep inside, but I know it's worth it because I need to be in good spiritual shape in the end. And today we're going real deep. We talked about humility, talked about honesty, talked about repentance. Today we're going to talk about purity and sexual immorality. You're going to say this is hard because the gap between God's standard and our existence is broader on this category than any other category. But what I'm going to say is it's worth it because we want to get in shape throughout this series. And what this verse just showed us is that sexual immorality is not just the big ones. It's not just sex before marriage if you're not married. It's not just sex with someone other than your husband or wife. Sexual immorality is much broader. It includes what you think. It includes what you watch. It includes what you say. Includes how you dress, includes much, much more than what we would think of. So let's come up with a practical definition, a working definition for what is sexual immorality. Because this says no sexual immorality, and anyone who is sexually immoral, it says right there, uh, the, the, God's wrath comes upon those. All right? So we need to define what it is. Here's my definition that we're going to go with for today sexual immorality is any sexual gratification outside of marriage. any sexual gratification outside of marriage. If I fantasize about someone who I'm not married to, if I'm single or married, if you're single, you're not married to anyone. If you're married, you're married to one person. If I'm fantasizing about someone, sexual immorality. If the jokes which I laugh at and contribute to are immoral and obscene jokes, sexual immorality. If the things that I'm flipping around on the TV and I'm going to watch the football game, but maybe I get stuck on that commercial on whatever channel because it's a nice, friendly commercial. Sexual immorality. Any sexual gratification outside of marriage is sexual immorality. Now, with that said, a topic I'm not going to talk about, but I'll just answer the question. There can be sexual immorality within marriage as well. That exists as well, but that's a different topic. So don't just think that because you're married, you've got a ring on your finger, then everything is game. That's not how it goes. But that's not my topic here for today. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. In case you think I'm being kind of overly harsh right here, Jesus said it himself. He said, I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is not how we judge adultery. This is not how we judge adultery. We judge adultery as the action. But like we talked about last week, sin does not begin with action. Sin begins with thought. And there's never more clear example in the area of immorality. Any sexual gratification outside of marriage, be it thought, be it word, be it action, be it anything, is sexual immorality. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, okay, Father Anthony, this was a nice sermon to preach back when you were a kid in the Stone Ages. We're in a year called 2017. This doesn't exist. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Every TV show features sex. Every, everyone online talks about these subjects. All the jokes are like this. Like, this is just how life is. Like, yeah, it's great when you were living like back to the future, back with, you know, the guy like in the 50s, but this is reality. And reality is, reality is, you don't think I know reality. You don't think that I watch football games on Sunday and I can't spend, go one commercial break without reading about Seattle or talking about Cialis. Okay, I can't go to the grocery store and talk about improve your sex life. Ten, easy. You don't think I understand this stuff? But what I'm saying is, again, we're not looking outside. We are looking for the world to be pure for us to be pure. 
And I'm saying that's not how we're going to do it. We're not going to say to God, well, I did my best, but the world is impure. God knows the world is impure. And he's not telling us that, that we'll just do your best because the world is. He's saying that we should, not, we should be in the world, but not of the world. That we should not let the impurity of the world come inside us. So that's why right off the bat, stop making excuses. Don't tell me about the excuses outside. I'm not talking about outside. I'm not talking about the world that you live in is dirty. I'm talking about inside. We're looking deep inside. And I'm talking about your heart. I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man who fell in a river. Man fell in a river. And he was a fast-moving river. And the river ends with a waterfall. So he was terrified. He fell in the river. He could barely swim. He fell in. Help! Save me! Somebody! Save me! Help! Help! All of a sudden, Jesus comes. And Jesus jumps in the river. And Jesus grabs him by the arm. Jesus pulls him ashore to safety. And Jesus saves his life. Thank you so much. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jesus says to him, as I have done to you, go and do likewise for others. Man said, absolutely. Next day, man walking by the river, sees one of his friends in the river. Actually sees two of his friends in the river. And there's his boss over there. And there's his neighbor. He says, oh, all the people in the river. I got to do my best to jump in and save them. Jumps in the river, starts to swim towards them. As he gets closer, he realizes they're not screaming for help. In fact, they seem to be laughing. They seem to be enjoying their time. They got rafts. The cooler raft too with the drinks. Having a good time. And he's like, y'all are in the river. Don't you realize it's dangerous? He said, no, 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 no. We've been in this river all day. It's been a great time. Kick back a cold one with us. And you say, but isn't it dangerous? He said, no, 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 no. We've been here all day. No, there haven't been any danger. We're getting some sun. It's great. He says, okay. He has a few drinks with him. And he jumps in the raft with him. And eventually they all go over the waterfall and die. But they died with a smile on their face. Dying with a smile on your face doesn't mean not dying. And this is a picture of the world today. Because all of us remember a time where we held this standard. And we said, you know what? I will not allow obscene jokes in my presence. I will not watch these things. I will not go to these websites. I will not flirt with that girl anymore. I will not flirt with that boy anymore. I will not dress that way to get him or him to flirt with me. We all remember that. But then what happens to us? We see a whole bunch of people in that river. They seem to be having a good time. They seem to be having a great time. Actually, we feel miserable. But if you go look at their Facebooks, they seem to be living the life. John chapter 17, verse 15 through 19. Jesus says, don't be fooled. In his final prayer for the apostles, he says to, him, says to the Father, he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I do not pray you take them out of the world. I know the world is evil. And if all I wanted was care just about them, yeah, take them out of the world. But I care about the other guy in the river too. So I want to save them, and then I want to teach them to go and save others. Keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you, watch this one. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus saved us from this world, but he did not remove us from this world. He left us in this world, and he left us for a reason. Because we are supposed to be the light of this world. And we are supposed to be the ones to help save others from that river. Jesus saved us. It's our job to help save others. We're here on a mission. Our problem is, is we forget and we crisscross the rules. And we forget that we're here to be helpers and saving people from the river. We just jump in and start having a good time with it. Would a doctor, would a doctor say to someone who smokes, say, you know what? Smoking is bad for you. And the guy says, but look, all my friends smoke. We have a good time. Say, okay, as long as you're having a good time. As long as you're having a good time, that's okay. This person comes in, this person is struggling with obesity and cholesterol. Say, but are you, do you eat good food? Yes, yeah, good food. Okay, enjoy. The more the world says smoking is okay, the more the doctors say smoking is not okay because they know the truth. They know that it's deadly. The more that we don't care about what we put in our body, the more our doctors say you have to care about what you put in your body. I'm not going to let the fact that everyone else is having a good time with sexual immorality influence the fact about what I decide to do. We get our roles mixed up. We're not supposed to be in the river partying. We're the lifeguards. We're supposed to be helping people get out of there. 
We're supposed to be the firefighters. When the people are in the burning building, we don't go and say, hey, what's on TV? We're supposed to be the ones say, hey, this building is going to burn. And if you don't get out of here, you're going to burn. And I'm trying to help you get out because I got to protect myself and get out of here too. That's how we need to view sexual immorality. Another verse from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification, sanctification and honor. Not in passion of the lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Meaning, not like the people who are partying in the river. Don't tell me about your roommates. Don't tell me about your coworker. Don't tell me about what your parents. Don't tell me about any of that stuff. I'm saying you, I saved you from the river, and now I've called you to a higher level of living. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Is this easy? No. Is this possible? Yes. Because here's what I discovered. That you who are saying the world is so bad, the world is so bad, the world is so bad. How much light, if I fill this entire room with darkness, darkness this entire floor of George Mason, and I have a little light, who's going to win? Can the darkness put out my light? Darkness cannot, no matter how much darkness you have, cannot put out a light. And no matter how little my light is, I walk into the darkest, darkest, darkest room, and that light makes a little bit of a light. Maybe it's small, but if I get a second light, and a third light, and a fourth light, and a fifth light, and a sixth, and a seventh, and an eighth, and ninth, and tenth, we can light up all of Arlington. We can light up all of Virginia. That's how we're called to live. And that's what we need to realize our calling. We don't party with those who are drowning. We're called to be the lifeguards to help save them. Now, why does this matter? Why is this so important? Why does the Bible make such a big deal? Why does it seem that the Bible makes a bigger deal out of sexual immorality than like lying? Or than like, you know, cursing? Or than, you know, um, coming late to church? Why does the Bible seem to make such a big deal out of sexual immorality? Well, I'll give you a verse from the Bible. The best way to answer that is ask the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6.18, St. Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin, watch this, Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So what it's telling us in this verse right here, St. Paul is saying that not all sin is the same. That sexual immorality, let's put that in a separate category. You say, hey, wait a minute. Isn't all sin the same? And isn't all sin separated from God? Look, all sin is the same in one, in one sense, and that it is spiritually it is distance between man and God. Sin is a barrier between man and God. And when we sin, there's distance between me and God. And when I repent, every sin, there's no problem. All sin is the same in that spiritual sense. But in an earthly sense, every sin has different consequences. And no, not all sin is the same. Not all sin is the same. And you understand this. If you come to me, and you push me like this. It's not nice. I may push you back, but that's probably going to be the end of it. Like, that's it. If you come to the President of the United States of America and boom, same result? No. You'd be in jail. If you say a lie to me, shouldn't do that. If you say a lie to a, a person who's dressed like me, but he's called a judge in court, same result? No. Because not every sin has the same consequence. Same sin. Not every sin has the same consequence on this earth. Same thing here. What St. Paul is saying is that sexual sin has a specific consequence that is greater than other sins. And that's why we have to treat it with such care. Sexual sins have deeper consequences than other sins. Our sexuality is more powerful than we realize. And when there's sin in my sexuality, it infects my entire body. And even what I want you to realize is that even, even the word sex itself is a powerful word. That you can hear all kinds of words, but then someone says the word sex, all of a sudden all eyes light up. Now I'll prove this to you. Go home today after church. Okay, and call your mom for your mom doesn't live here. Call your mom and tell your mom, guess what we talked about in church today? And your mom will say, what, prayer? You say, no, we read the Bible. No, we didn't talk about the Bible. Faith, no. Say, mom, we talked about sex. And you see if I don't get a few calls from your mother. I remember one time, show you the power of just the word sex. One time we were doing a purity retreat for like seventh and eighth graders, like a long time ago. And I titled the retreat, The Power of Sex. That's what we called it, The Power of Sex. Okay, and we don't tell them them in advance, like they show up. 
all right, but one kid, I guess, saw something, okay, and these kids found out that the thing was called the power of sex. So before the first session, you know how like a middle school retreat, you gotta like rally them up, like you gotta find them, like they're like on top of things and hiding, you gotta, come on, it's time for the talk, I'm telling you, we separated boys and girls, man, those boys were all front and center, they were ready to go for that first session. And I start off and say, okay, we got handouts coming around. They're like, oh, he's gonna give us pictures, there's gonna be pictures. <laughs> those boys were pumped for that retreat. Because sexuality is powerful. And when we have sin in our sexual life, it pervades every aspect of our lives. You want to know why? Genesis chapter 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When Moses writes about how we were created, he tells us we were created in two ways. Two most important things about how you were created. The two most important things about how you were created. Number one, image of God. Number two, male or female. You created image of God and male or image of God and female. He didn't say doctor, lawyer, engineer. He didn't say tall, short, rich, poor. What defining characteristic of you and me, number one, image of God. Each of us bears the image of God inside of us. And number two, my maleness or your femaleness. And that refers to your sexuality. So when I have sin in my maleness, it pervades every aspect of my life. Everywhere I go, I'm male. I'm male at work, I'm male at home, I'm male everywhere I go. So when there's sin in my maleness or your femaleness, it goes with you can't leave it aside. That's why I say, my kid has just started sex ed, like we call it family life, he goes to a Christian school, so they just started this sex education stuff and he's in sixth grade. And people ask me, don't you think it's too young to start like sex education? First of all, I don't think it's too young. But I'd say even more than that, I don't think the problem is that the schools teach sex education too young, I'll tell you what I personally think the problem, I think they don't teach enough. I think the problem is they limit the information that they teach. And they only teach the physical aspect of sex. The sex is much more than physical. Look, if the physical side was that, look, I can put two dogs in a room, a boy dog and a girl dog, and they'll figure the physical part out, okay? That's not rocket science. What kids need to understand, what we all need to understand, is that sex and our sexuality is not physical. Only is physical. It's emotional, it's psychological, it's spiritual, it's relational. Like there's a lot more to it. What I wish that people knew is that your sexuality is a gift from God. It's not something that God says, no, don't touch it, that's bad, we don't talk about that stuff. It's a gift from God. But like any gift from God, it can be used or misused. I have a car that I buy for my kid. Okay, I have a car that I buy for my kid. Let's say my kid is 15, I buy him a car. So when he's 16, he can drive that car. That, that car is a gift for me to the kid. But let's say the kid takes it at age 15 and he starts driving around town. Let's say he takes it at age 12 and starts driving around town. That gift of God, I'm gonna say, don't touch this. And you must abstain from this. And you say, why, you're so mean. It's not mean, it's you're not ready for it. And you driving the car before you're 16, you are a danger to yourself and to everyone else out there on the road. And the sexuality is the same way. It is a gift from God to be used in a certain way. And when it's used that way, it's freedom, it's joy, it's, it's the highest of highs that you can get, that God planned for us. But when it's abused and it's used the wrong way, it's death and danger to both you and everyone else around you. I think that God in heaven, looking down to us, his children, seeing our casual attitude about sexual immorality, must break his heart. Seeing us flippant about what we watch on TV, nonchalant about the jokes we tell, trying, trying, sorry ladies, trying to get someone else to flirt with me by the way I dress, inviting him to sexual immorality by the way we dress. You know what that is? That's watching a baby. It's watching a baby play with a blowtorch. That's watching a baby play with a loaded gun. And I see God up there saying, please, for my sake, put down the gun. Put down the blowtorch. You are a threat to yourself and everyone else around you when you do not understand the gift of sexuality that I have gifted you. And I want you to fulfill in the right way and in the right time. Oftentimes people come to me, if you don't believe the sexual sins have deeper consequences, people come to me all the time who have never 
come and talk before and they say, I have to confess. I have to like get something off my chest. And they say, Father Anthony, I'm about to say something that I've never said my entire life. 100% of the time, it's sexual sin. Not 90, not 95, 100%. No one ever comes and says, I got something weighing on me. I took pencils out of the supply closet. I just got to get it up. Never. The deep-seated stuff, and I'll prove it to you. Go back. Let's say I can give you an eraser on one thing that's happened to you in your life. One thing that you've done, one mistake you made, I give you an eraser for one thing. You go back in time and change one thing, the thing you regret the most, thing you're most embarrassed about. And I bet you, I bet you, we won't fulfill this because I don't, but I bet you that it's related to the area of sexuality. I bet you that the vast majority of people, and I really want to say 100%, I would really love to, if someone's not sexuality, I'd love to hear what that is. But I bet you we would go back and we'd say, yeah, you know what? Because sexual sins have deeper consequences. And when God tells us to abstain, it's not because he's the fun police, because he understands us. He wrote the manual for this, and he knows how this works, and he knows the danger that lies within. Now, with that said, I told you in the beginning, I want to convince you of the deadly nature of sexual sin and then help you get a plan to overcome it. Finish the first part. And to be honest, this is where most sermons start on this subject. Most sermons, the easiest sermon to preach, stand up here and tell you what you're doing is wrong, that's bad, don't touch, God judges, glory be to God, and finish. That's the easiest sermon. And that's where most sermons on sexual immorality stop. I want to take the next step. And I want to talk about how we can overcome it. And the same kind of going with the mindset of the spiritual sweat. I'm not giving you a formula because I don't believe in formulas. There's no formula to get your body in shape. But there's exercises that are recommended. These three exercises, if you do them, they will help. And I'm going to give you three exercises to do in the area of sexual sin that we need to do these no matter what state we're in, no matter what we messed up. We messed up yesterday, messed up last week, messed up 10 years ago. Whatever it is we messed up, three exercises to help you combat the sexual sin and fight for your purity. Exercise number one. Commit to God's standard. Now, what I really wanted to say is recommit to God's standard. If you've never committed to God's standard, make the commitment. If you already have but slipped, recommit. And what I want to say is when you slip again, which is inevitable, recommit. I'm talking about a constant, ongoing commitment to God's standard of reminding myself. We talked last week, repentance starts in the mind. So here we go. Start in the mind and say what God says goes. What God says is right. Doesn't matter if it's hard, what God says is right. Our problem is we confuse right with common. And we think because something is not common, therefore it's not right. So God says, no sexual immorality. You shouldn't look at these things, shouldn't watch these things. And we say, but everybody's doing it. I didn't say everybody's not doing it. I'm saying it's wrong. But you say, but, but uh, everyone around me does this, not a big deal. I'm not telling you if it's common or not common. I understand it's common, but common and right are not the same. And one can make the argument that right is usually nine out of 10 times not common because Jesus said the road is narrow that leads to life. Said another way, the area of sexual immorality is not democracy. It's not like whatever the majority of the people want will make that the standard. It's what God says goes. And there's a great example of this from the book of Daniel. Daniel was a young man, prophet in the Old Testament. He was taken, he was one of the people, who, the Israelites who were taken captive into a land called Babylon. Jews, believing in God, righteous, the law, the temple, the sacrifices, Babylonians, heathens, pagans, most corrupt society around, and they lived a very licentious lifestyle, okay, very hedonistic, and this is where Daniel finds himself over here. And while Daniel is there, he gets promoted up, and he gets found by the king, and he's now working in the court of the king. And while he's working in the court of the king, he's able to eat of the delicacies of the king's house. He's at the palace, where the food is really good. Now, the problem is these foods are against their dietary restrictions. So Daniel must make a choice. What I know to be right or what is common. Should I stick with what I was taught is right and wrong or should I just kind of do what everyone else is doing? And it says this in Daniel 1.8. This is a good memory verse for you. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart, which that means, I don't know if it's purpose or proposed. I don't know how to pronounce it. The purpose or proposed. Purpose, let's go with it, okay? Means made, like resolved. He resolved in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Before Daniel got to the dinner table, this is the most important part. 
before he got to the dinner table, Daniel said, no matter what they offer me, I'm not going to eat it. I'm sticking to the right thing. What do we do? Let's take the same example with food. We're fasting. We know we should be fasting. Whatever they serve, I'm going to eat. Because I don't want to be an offense. I don't want to we, we be an offense. Okay. They had one thing, a steak, and they had 10 vegetables. You could eat all the 10 of the vegetables and never need. I don't want to be an offense. What's the difference between us and Daniel? We look for excuses. Like, I'm not saying that there isn't a time where sometimes you break your fast. I, I'm not saying that. I'm not legalistic by any means. But what I'm saying is there's a difference between I'm trying my best and I have no choice versus what we do is we look for excuses. Oh, no, but I'm going to marry him. So it's going to be okay. Oh, no, but, you know, it was just in front of me. I just happened to see it. Oh, no, this dress is too tight. No, I didn't notice. We look for excuses to be immoral, and that's a big difference. The starting point is we must commit to God's standard. Daniel said, this stream is going to be, um, is going this way, and I will fight against the stream. And I may, in the end, fall at the end of the river. I may, at the end, fall, but you know what? It's not going to be because I didn't try. Step one is deciding who's the authority of your life. Is it God's word or the world? Who sets the standards? God? or society, or culture, or your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, or what happens to me on TV? Is it that I am just, like I'm Gumby, like I have no muscles whatsoever, and I'm just a leaf blowing in the wind, and if the wind blows me sexually immoral, okay? And if the wind blows me this way, okay? Or am I going to say, you know what? I am going to fight tooth and nail to keep this standard, even knowing that I'm probably going to fall. Look here. You know on, guys, on your wedding day, you tell your wife, or before your wedding day, hopefully, that I will never look at another woman ever again. I will never look at another woman ever again. Does that mean that you never look at another woman? No, you'll probably fall in that. But you can't go into the wedding and say, I'm hopefully only going to look at other women on Saturdays and Fridays. Like You can't go in like that. You go in and say, I'm never looking at another woman again, knowing that you may look. And then you apologize and she'll forgive you because that's kind of how life goes. Same thing with God. Yes, you're going to fall in sexual immorality. You're going to fall. But we are not going to fall before we've even started. We're going to start and say, we're going to fight. We're going to kick. We're going to scream. We're going to do everything we can for our purity because it's the cat poop. I don't want that cat poop anywhere near me. Number one, commit to God's standard. Number two, control your mental slash visual intake. Your mental slash visual intake. Control what goes inside your body. A body that allows any kind of food to go inside will be a bad shaped body. A body that just eats anything, okay, that accepts Twinkies and Ho-Hos and whatever it may be, like the body is gonna bear the results. Well, I'm afraid that spiritually, a lot of our bodies are pathetic because of the junk we put inside of us. Imagine this example. I know I'm risking my life with this example, but it's such a good example, so no political statements made here. Immigration. No political statements. What is immigration? I go into travel to Canada. I go and I stand in the very long line, the non-Canadian residents, okay, the non-citizens. So I stand in this very, very, very long line. And I'm like, why do people get to go so fast? Why do you let them go in and, and they say, you know what? You're not a citizen. You stand over here in this line. I get to the front of the line. They ask me a million questions. They don't just say, nice to meet you. I heard, no, a million questions. Where are you going? Why are you here? What's your birthday? What's your wife? Uh, a million questions. And they don't let me go. And I'm like, I need to go inside because there's someone waiting for me. They don't let me go until what? Until they have determined what? That I am not a harm to go inside. That I am not dangerous to go inside. That's what they do. That's why they ask you a million questions. Well, I'm saying that you and your body need an immigration station. You need a little guy here, and I'd both to your mind and to your eyes. The little guy that someone comes in, here comes a movie. You say, hold up, excuse me, sir. Please come over here to the side. I need to ask you a few questions. And before I let this movie inside, I need to make sure that this movie is not here to harm me. But why would I let someone who say, this movie says, I'm coming to kill you. I'm coming to cat poop inside your soup. You say that you can't come in. And then here comes a conversation over here, a joking. And I say, hey, wait a minute, sorry. Before I enter this conversation, what's going on over here? What, and I ask you some questions, and I dig apart your suitcase, and I see you, you have dangerous things. So you know what? I'm sorry, I can't participate in this, and you need to go away. But I want, I want. no, I'm sorry. You, you're harmful right here. We have to have a custom station, immigration station in our minds, on our eyes, before we just let any junk in. 
St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, everything we watch, everything we read, the music we listen to, the people we hang out with, before they enter, we put them, we take them captive, and we say, we need to ask you a few questions before I let you in my life. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. I put mental and visual. Two ways, mental and visual. Why? Because some of us are more visually oriented, the men usually. Some of us are more emotionally or mentally or in our thoughts. So what I mean by that is those who are the visual know their immorality. And it's easy to kind of throw darts at them. And that's usually, like I said, the guys. But ladies, sometimes when ladies think, oh, I don't do that stuff. Hold on one second, sister. One preacher I heard him say one time that more men watch pornography daily, but more women commit it daily. And you are disgusted by your boyfriend or your husband who took a look at the waitress as she, you know, and took a second look and that's disgusting to you. But I'm telling you that the waitress, when she left the house looking that way in order to get the second look, is equally at fault. We need to have no discrimination up here. We love men and women the same. And we easy for us to see that the, that the sexual immorality could be our eyes, could be our thoughts, could be what we say, could be what we hear. It could be the fantasies. It could be the videos. Like it could be either way. And we know that oftentimes the sexual gratification that we derive is not necessarily always in a visual way. Number three. So number one, commit to God's standard. Number two, control what goes inside. And then number three, come up with a plan. Come up with a plan. What I mean by this is fight smarter, not harder. Too many of us, we are trying to fight harder. We're trying to push down this wall by sheer brute force. And we say this sexual immorality, this sexual sin is too hard. I keep trying to knock it down. I can't. Well, I'm going to say is, let's be smart. Don't try to be stronger than it. Try to be smarter than it. There's a girl I know who suffered with migraine headaches. Suffered with migraines for a long time. Migraines, migraines, migraines. And this was t terrible. I never had a migraine, but they say they're awful. They're the worst thing in the world. Suffers the migraines. Then she was able to discover that the trigger for the migraines was caffeine. And she cut out the caffeine. And the migraines went away. Let me ask you a question. Did this girl beat her migraine? The migraine came and she overpowered her migraine? No. But she was smart, she just went around it. And she just found a solution to go around. Some of us are trying to knock down sexual morality, and I'm gonna knock it down. And I'm telling you, you're not gonna knock it down. David couldn't knock it down, Solomon couldn't knock it down, Samson couldn't knock it down, no one could knock it down. But be smart. Don't fight harder, fight smarter. What I mean by that is, the same way this girl's caffeine, or the migraines were triggered by caffeine, you have triggers. You have triggers that lead you to lust, that lead you to immorality. Figure out the trigger. Figure out what it is that's pushing you down the wrong path. For example, you know too much free time means you're going to go online and do bad stuff. Keep yourself busy. Go to the gym. Take a walk. Talk to a human being. Like, go outside. Keep yourself busy. Don't seclude yourself and say, no, this time I'm not going to do it. You know that every time you talk to this group of people that every time the conversation ends up going into a bad direction. Talk to this group of people. You know that every time you go to your boyfriend's house or your girlfriend's house, you end up fooling around. And you say, no, this time is going to be different. I don't think it'll be different. If it's different, I bet you it's going to be worse. You know what I say to do? You know what me and Marianne did when we were dating? You're gonna laugh at us. All of our dates, majority of our dates, we would go to the mall. We were like 23, 24, whatever it was, and we would go to the mall, and we'd get like ice cream, and we'd sit in the mall on the chairs. And there would be like the seventh and eighth graders being like, lame-o, <laughs> and like laughing at us, because we were lame. But you know what? I'll take lame. I'll take lame versus cat poop. I'll take my ice cream, pure chocolate, sprinkles, beautiful, versus the risk of cat poop in my soup. 
you to figure out what triggers you. Figure out what times of day. Is it morning? Is it night? Is it lunchtime? Figure out what places. Whenever I go here, whenever we go there, figure out what activities. What is it that triggers you? Like, be smart. Like, there's no, nothing new under the sun. Like, you, we always think like that my situation is the most unique, and every time, it's not. Just study the pattern. I'm telling you, there's a pattern, and you come up with a solution when the sin is small. St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You say, no, that's not true. Because I walked into a temptation that was stronger than me. And what I say is, go back and see if maybe God gave you an escape route before you got in there. But woe to the man. Woe to the man who walks into the den of lions. And then prays, say, God, deliver me from these lions. Woe to that man. Woe to the man who puts poison in his drink and then says, please, God, I'm trusting you to not make me sick. Woe to that man who invites sexual immorality and walks in the path that he knows will lead to sexual immorality and then prays, God, deliver me from it when he walked right into it. Commit to God's standard. Number two, control what goes inside you. Number three, Come up with a plan. Last thing I want to leave you all with, in case you're still not convinced of why purity matters. Purity, well, let's do the flip of it. Impurity, immorality in the sexual area, nothing will put a wall between you and God faster than sexual immorality. And you know this to be true. That's why, like I said, we carry the guilt for so long, we just want to get it off our chest. You know this to be true. Nothing will put a barrier between you and God faster. But here I have good news for you. I have good news for you. There's hope. There's always hope. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad, I can see some of your eyes right now thinking to yourself, I drank all the cat poop, like I'm filled with cat poop, like I'm just, I'm going to have cat poop coming out every angle. No matter how much cat poop you drink, there's a solution. I know a really good doctor, and that doctor specializes in removing the worst things from inside you. And once upon a time, Susan actually alluded to her earlier. I loved it when she said it. There's a lady called the Samaritan woman. We read about her in John chapter 4. And that lady came to a well one day filled with cat poop sin, filled with sexual immorality. Her life, as we later discover, she had five husbands. And the one that she's with right now was not her husband. She's working on number six, and she's going for the perfect number seven after that. She lived in a very immoral life, and it weighed her down. She was the most miserable person. She went out to the well at a time where she thought no one would be there because she hated to see people. She was depressed. She had no self-esteem. She felt like the biggest piece of garbage on the planet. And then she met Jesus. And Jesus asked her, well, actually, first before Jesus asked her, he spoke to her about, you know what? I can offer you something to make you never thirsty again. And if truly the sexual immorality was fulfilling her and satisfying her as she thought it would, as she thought it would, if truly it was, she would have said, no, thank you, sir. What I got is better. But she jumped at it and said, I hate what I'm drinking. I'll take whatever it is you got. Jesus said, okay, I'll give you the water. But there's one condition. Go call your husband. And he went straight to the sexual immorality. What Jesus was saying in that sentence, he's saying, I want to give you the world. And I got the world here for you. And there's no limit to what I'm going to pour into your life, into your relationship, into your marriage, into your career. I'm going to pour so much good stuff into you. But this sexual immorality is a problem. It's a barrier. Let's deal with this. And she did deal with it, and she put it off to the side. And then the floodgates opened. And her life was never the same again. What are the chances? And I don't know the answer to this. But what are the chances that maybe your sexual immorality is a barrier to God's working in your life? What are the chances that the little compromises that you're making are stopping God from doing what he really wants to do in your life? I don't know. And for some of us, maybe the answer is no. Maybe some of us, we're fighting a good fight, so I'm not saying it has to be yes for everyone. I don't know. But I think it's worth asking ourselves because I think what's on the other side is worth it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman was using sexual immorality as an anesthesia to try to cover up her pain, 
And what we actually discovered is that the sexual immorality was not the anesthesia. Actually, it was the cause of the pain. The sexual immorality was not the anesthesia. It was actually the cause. And once she got rid of it, and once she repented of it, then she saw God. And her life was never the same. What are the chances that me and you can have a Samaritan woman kind of moment this Lent? That we can have a blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God moment this Lent when we attack sexual immorality in the same way. Let's stand together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for calling us to such a high standard. And sometimes we think, Lord, we can never meet that standard. But I know, Lord, you're like cheering us on. You're like in our corner. And I know, Lord, that you'll never leave us in a situation by ourselves that's maybe more than we can handle, Lord, but never more than you can handle. I pray, Lord, truly that you give freedom to people today who are struggling, who are like in prison with sexual sin, that you give us the freedom, Lord, to walk in liberty, to walk in righteousness, and to walk in purity, that we can see you, Lord, that whatever kinds of scales in front of our eyes from the sexual sin, that we would repent of it. And I pray that you wouldn't let anyone leave here like the feeling of guilt and feeling bad and feeling like there's no hope, but, Lord, that you are our hope. You are the hope of those who have no hope as you were with the Samaritan woman, I pray, Lord, you would be with all of us as well. These things I pray in the name of your Son, the prayers of all your saints. Here it says, we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.